Chicago as an artist in residence. And so I had a work commissioned and showed two pieces in the stairwell. And uh, one of my paintings is now in the hotel region. It's a bunch of hashtags. And over the years, I really enjoyed just dwelling in the battery and having all these conversations. And in the past year or two, I've really gone into conversations around placemaking and also work since my background is in architectural design. And uh, I thought we'd share some insights about conscious dwelling and how that is extremely relevant to our lives at this moment. So let's just, I'll just start with the presentation. So what to look out for is, I'm gonna give you about 30 minutes of background about the kind of ideas that have been percolating in my mind over the past 20 years. And then we're gonna do a little exercise where we're going to basically map our homes and look at how that space is able to accommodate our consciousness at this time. And then we'll have some Q&A and we'll have a case study with Paige Loxie, whose home I've been working on for the past year. All right, so here we go. Can everyone see the screen and hear me just fine? We're okay? Okay, great. So welcome to the Conscious Dwelling and Introduction to Placemaking. And so for those of you who are battery members, you've all walked in and I think you have seen when you walk in, do you guys recognize this? This is the corner to the right when you walk in right by the intercom. And if you look at the plaque right next to it, there's this plaque. So this is to the right of the front door and it says we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. The battery established 2012. Have any of you guys seen this? I always kind of look at it when I go in because it still resonates with so many things that I think about. And it reminds me of several different teachings that I've received on this subject. And so the first thing that I think of is what one of my feng shui teachers likes to say, which is nine seconds after you enter a building, you are affected by the consciousness of the building. And so many different cultures talk about this in different ways. That the shape of our home impacts us in ways that we cannot know necessarily, but on many different levels. And so this is from a feng shui teacher. This quote happens to be actually from Winston Churchill. So this was spoken by Winston Churchill on October 28th, 1943. So almost exactly 77 years ago, he spoke this quote. And it was actually in a speech that you can read online to parliament as they were debating in the meeting of the House of Lords, whether the House of Commons, which was destroyed by the Germans in 1941 should be rebuilt exactly as before or should be renovated and changed. And the debate is fascinating about the shape of the building. Should they keep the elliptical structure so they make it modern and semicircular? And his argument for the restoration of the building exactly as before was that he wanted to preserve the traditions of British parliamentary government. And this is what he said. We shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. So the context of post-World War II rebuilding this is what this quote came from. So here's uh, an excerpt from the whole uh, speech, which is quite fascinating. Here's a picture of the House of Commons before it was bombed out. And here he says it. I always like to put the quote in context. So we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. And then he says right after that, having dwelt and served for more than 40 years in the late chamber and having enjoyed that so much, he wanted to recreate that pleasure by building the building as before. And so this connection between shape and dwelling and holding, you can almost say a remembrance, a memory and a consciousness and this historical moment. And so it's hard to really talk about World War II or building without looking at how that impacted modernism and the modern buildings that we're currently living in, right? So we're currently living in a type of building style modernism, which emerged with the post-war build, post-war rebuilding. So where do you dwell when more than half of your city is gone? 
And so we often look at World War II as the deadliest military conflict in history, but we don't talk about how it impacted architecture and the modern built environment. So 70 to 85 million people perished, but how many buildings were destroyed as well? How much of our culture was also lost and how did that impact architecture? If you look at London, 70,000 buildings were destroyed, 1.7 million were damaged. Okay, 70,000 buildings. We can't even actually imagine that. If you look at Berlin, 70% of the city, that's more than half of your city is gone. Dresden, 75% destroyed. And then Tokyo, which is often not talked about as much as the European cities. In a single night, the Tokyo firebombing, 270,000 buildings were destroyed. So this is all the scene for modernism and the emerging of our current um, building types. And that quote from Winston Churchill in front of the battery. So it's this feeling of the time to rebuild. Some were restored, some presented opportunities to create a new architecture. And so this idea of heroic modernism rising from the ashes was this foundation. When half of your city is gone, something else rises, right? It's this phoenix, it's this idea of a new world. And so here you have an example of a church in, in England, which actually decided not to rebuild. So it kept, you can see this um, chapel, which was destroyed, and then it rebuilt a modern structure next to it. So you have this juxtaposition, which you see all the time in Europe and other places where the shell of the ancient structure is here, and then you have this new modern church next to it. And so you can see the different shapes, consciousness, the different shapes of dwelling. And so when you look at this, I always ask, did the legacy, did the world ever heal? Was this how we healed? How do we heal? Some of us healed by rebuilding the same building. Some of us healed by building a new structure and some never healed. And so I've been reading about survivors of the Tokyo firebombing who have never really healed in that they've never had a memorial really commemorate what their experience was. So here's a quote from one of the survivors of Tokyo's destruction. The smell is one that will never leave me. And here's a picture I like to show from different sides of the conflict. This is Dresden. This is a beautiful image, really poignant, really devastating of a bombed out city and this remnant of architectural ornament gazing upon the devastation. And so what was lost? One thing unequivocally was lost, an enormous amount of architectural ornament. This is not really talked about. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what ornament is and what the loss of it means for our consciousness. So ornament is the Greek word for cosmos. If you see this angel here, this is a moment of architectural ornament. It's not sculptural, it's actually, you can see it's part, perhaps at the top of the church or the top of the building, it's integrated into the structure. Oftentimes architectural ornament tells the story of the place. It's the narrative element of architecture. It also inhabits the liminal space, the space in between the roof and the sky, the space in between the step and the door, the space in between the door and the entryway. Ornament is also the edge condition. It's that transitional space. It's also sacred geometry, rhythm and symmetry. And it's come to be the connection between the body, the building and the cosmos, the connection between building and nature and the connection between time and space. And so what happens when you systematically destroy architectural ornament? And what does that do to our consciousness? It was systematically destroyed from human cities, as we've seen in these images, but also from the human psyche, which I'll talk about. And its destruction and annihilation is part of modern architecture. So what happens to the human psyche when you eliminate one of the things that held it, the story of the place, the narrative structure of the place? And how did its removal reshape the human psyche? And to this day, as we're stuck in our homes, feeling trapped, how are we still being shaped by it? So this is all within the context of we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. So when I say destruction of ornament from the human psyche, I'm referring to the movement of the Bauhaus leaders 
specifically this man named Adolf Luce and his work called Ornament is Crime. So it was actually uh, framed as part of the old world that had to be annihilated and create space for this new world and this tabula rasa. And this idea that somehow this old language was holding us back from the modernity. And so it's a little bit like the baby out with the bathwater. And so part of the modernist aesthetic was removing not just ornament, but transforming the edge condition of buildings. So that buildings no longer had edges, which held stories. They, had, they became edges that didn't tell stories other than have their hard modern edge. And so here's just an example of an edge condition. So what is an edge condition? When you look at a building, you see its contour. So here you have the modern edge. It's hard, nothing grows on it. If you look at buildings before 1935, 1945, they have detail. They have a pre-modern edge. It's an organic edge. It's an edge that grows. It's an edge that holds a story, whatever that story may be. And so with the elimination of these types of edges, literally changing the shape of the dwellings that we live in and changing the shape of our cities, this liminal space is a space of transition and transformation. What happens when you systematically eliminate the threshold condition as a site for architectural design is actually to severely handicap architecture's ability to respond to changing social conditions, to stories, to people's emotions. There's nowhere for you to go. And so one of the legacies of modernism, for better or for worse, is the elimination of this level of cosmos. And so this is one of my professors from college, Carson Harris, and he wrote, to reduce space to objective space is to make it impossible for human beings to ever discover their place in the world. And so part of the removal of ornament is also the objectification of space. So the space becoming uh, reified an object not necessarily a space of the psyche, but a space that you buy and sell, a space that you rent and move in and out of. So where are we now? We're still in the legacy of modernism and the elimination of cosmos, but we're stuck in it in a way that we've never been stuck in it before. <laughs> so, you know, the record, our virus, this was a few days ago at the New York Times, a new record for virus cases. So this idea of being quarantined in their home, we're stuck in our modern and postmodern homes. We're stuck more than ever before in these spaces that are based upon what's measurable and what's modular. And our homes, modern homes are designed as functional dwelling units, not as cosmic devices that intentionally place the soul in space and time. Right? Your realtor doesn't sell you a cosmic device that's intentionally used to place your soul. <laughs> but architecture used to have that function. So looking at why do we feel stuck in our homes now, a little bit of historical context. How do we place ourselves inside our homes? And you'll notice if you, have, if you live in a modern condo, your home is not designed to scale inwards or outwards. It's a box with hard edges. We also are modern psyches because we are shaped by these homes that cannot scale in or out. They're not connected to the cosmos when they're designed. We are also not designed to scale inwards or outwards. And so we live in these Cartesian cities. Just a little bit of background on that. This is a, a famous utopian city proposed by Le Corbusier called the Radiant City. You'll see it's literally based on the Cartesian hash and it's this, these straight grid lines. And this uh, ideal city that he wrote about and proposed became a huge influence on post-war building and solving the post-war building crisis. And so you'll see that in accordance with modernist ideals of progress, the Radiant City was designed to emerge from a blank slate demolished vernacular European cities. And these cities are designed to function as a quote unquote living machine, the result of a perfect form. So they're designed to function in the most, you can say, 
industrially effective housing machine. Let's just put people in as much sort of high density housing as we can that can be built as quickly as possible, right? This is a very modern, it's influenced a huge amount of city planning. This is from the 1930s. So how do we get out? <laughs> For me, I'm like, I grew up in Manhattan. Now I live in Berkeley, but it's like, how do we get out of these Cartesian constructs? How do we start a path from the Cartesian city, from the Cartesian home to a cosmic conscious space? And so I've just put a little hex hexagon on here just to frame it. And so what if we just tried to create another grid on top, a honeycomb grid or a hex grid or something else? That's not gonna work. You can't just bring back ornament. It's much more complex because of what's been eliminated. We have to rehabilitate human consciousness in order to bring back a conscious dwelling experience and a conscious dweller. This involves rebuilding the edge condition. And this begins with you, the indweller and not the architect. And so one of the things that we're up against, part of the Cartesian mindset, the Cartesian buildings that we live in is the supremacy of the visible. It's the supremacy of what's measurable and what you can actually graph and create data, visible data from. And so if it's not measurable, it's not relevant. This is the current Cartesian mindset, the current, I call it supremacy of the visible. And so part of becoming conscious, part of rehabilitating human consciousness is expanding beyond the visible. So before we expand, what's the implication? I went to architecture school. <laughs> so we were taught to design, to do analysis based upon visible reality and design based upon purely what's visible. So the implication of designing around the assumption that what is invisible is irrelevant leads to space. What kind of space? There's no space for expansion beyond what our limited human minds can understand. So think about that. Your home is designed to not accommodate anything that can't be measured. Okay, that's crazy. Your emotions can't be measured. Your happiness can't be measured. Your soul can't be measured. Your homes aren't designed to house those things. That's why it sucks to be stuck in them. <laughs> you don't have room for those things. That's modern. That didn't used to be how people built. So let's expand the data set. So the first thing that we do, see this is visible. There's so much other data we need to start bringing to mind as we create our own spaces, our own consciousness and our lives to acknowledge that other part of us that's not visible. How about the invisible, the audible, the inaudible, the tangible, the intangible, the fathomable, and the most important thing I think to design for is the unfathomable. So in my research in undergrad, I was researching Vedic architecture and the ancient architects of India we're taught to leave 50% to God because you can't understand most of what you're building. So don't pretend that you can. And so the hubris of the modern architect of being God has reduced the unfathomable to not relevant. Whereas it's one of the most relevant things is that we can't know everything. And so I call this a phenomenal data set. And this comes from the Greek word phainen, which means to appear, to reveal, or to bring to light. And so a conscious dwelling doesn't just house your functional body that needs to eat and sleep. It houses all levels of your consciousness. There's many different ways to break this down for the simplicity of this presentation and conversations around design. We've broken it down to 10 levels. So your building, your house, your home, think about how it houses all of these parts, all of these structures of your consciousness, your soul, your DNA, your emotions, your thoughts, your energy, all of these can't really be measured. 
but they're really important to the quality of your dwelt experience, your body, your breath, your auric field. Yosha's here, great. She can talk about houses and their auric field and how they house your auric field. Resources, environment, and cosmos. Cosmos is worldview. You can say your belief systems, your culture. And so a little bit on historical precedence. This is the Vastu Purusha Mandala. This is how Vedic architecture looked at building. And so it was, this is Purusha is the cosmic man. And they placed this cosmic man on the local side of the house, every house, not just sacred temples, every house. So Vastu means dwelling, comes from the Sanskrit root Vas, which means to dwell. And you see this word in the Yoga Sutra, right at the beginning, where it talks about the goals of yoga. Right before this verse, the sutra goes Yogashtha Vritti Naroda, one of the most famous verses, which is yoga is stopping the fluctuations of the mind. And then 1.3, Tada Drashtu Svarupe Vastanam. So on the day your yoga is successful, what happens? You come to Vastu, you come to dwell in your true nature. And so this idea of dwelling in one's true nature, one of the goals of yoga, one of the goals of conscious living is how can you come to dwell in that place? And the pursuit of this day, the pursuit of this lifestyle is the pursuit of this day, that that becomes your day-to-day -day life, you dwelling in your true nature. And so, this mandala is what's known as a cosmicizing device. I didn't make up this word. One of my architecture teachers used it. Cosmicize means to make something cosmic. So how do you place a human in a home? In this case, in the context of yoga, how do we yoke the cosmos to the building? Yoga means to yoke. So connecting the microcosm to the macrocosm. So just to compare and contrast, the placement of the ancient human form, this is just one culture's example with the Vastu Purusha Mandala. And this is how you often see people placed in homes currently. I actually researched this. Uh, these are called people texture. <laughs> so on one side, you have Vastu Purusha Mandala. On the other side, you have people textures that you can download. So these are often how we see images of people placed in spaces. There are little people textures and architectural renderings. So this is a Miami Beach home by Bob Dylan. It's a very beautiful home. And so you'll notice that people texture is not about yoking to the cosmos. It's actually about selling the condo. So architects place the people in almost as an afterthought and almost not really wanting to put the people in because it messes up the clean lines. So people texture is a rhetorical device. It's actually used to sell the property. It's not a cosmicizing device at all. And so now we're, I'm not the only one who's talking about this, far from it. There's an entire field in philosophy that is critical of this whole, of everything I'm talking about the post-war Cartesian objectification of space as denying the levels of the human psyche. It's an entire field called architectural phenomenology in philosophy. And one of the most famous proponents of this, he wrote actively in the 1960s and 70s, is Gaston Bachelard in his book, The Poetics of Space. It's like required reading for many, many architects. And it's an extraordinary book. And in it, he, he says, home is the topography of our intimate being. And he talks about how the home houses the psyche. And he talks about uh, the poetics of living and architecture as part of a phenomenological exercise. But what has his influence been actually on modern architecture and practice? And the answer is very little. And here's why. So lots of philosophers say stuff, but the architectural discipline doesn't practice them. And Harvard Design Magazine explains why. 
I just, this beautiful little sentence explains like why four years was really frustrating at Yale, which is a bastion of modernism where I studied from my undergrad. So the problem, according to Harvard Design Magazine, so this is their historical assessment of Bachelor Yard's writings and how it's relevant to how we experience space and practice placemaking today. So the problem is that for Bachelor Yard and architectural phenomenologists, space is a container, is not a container for three-dimensional objects. In other words, space is the psyche, space is consciousness. It's so much more than an actual three-dimensional container. And so, argues Harvard Design Review, the phenomenology of dwelling has little to do with the analysis of architecture. It's pretty much irrelevant, that's what they're saying. So the fact that space is the abode of the human consciousness and the problem for the philosopher is to study how it accommodates consciousness. This, they're saying, makes it not really relevant for architecture. So she actually says, in this sense, any application of these ideas requires a cautious approach at best. Why? Well, everything we know about architecture as a historical discipline stands in the way of everything we know about the poetics of dwelling. That's insane. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be that way. So I spent um, a couple of years at Yale having this like butting my head against why doesn't architecture care about how you actually experience space? And I actually proposed a thesis on yoga and architecture and it got, they didn't let me write it for at the beginning. And it actually went all the way to the Dean's office and they're like, Jessica, you can't write about yoga and architecture. And my thesis advisor actually said, Jessica, can you just write about Corbusier? <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> There's so much written about Corbusier. Why can't we open up the discipline of architecture so that it includes other forms of knowing and other forms of experiencing into how we design? It doesn't have to be stuck in Western European modernism, which is where it's currently stuck because of all these reasons that I've listed. And so this is the shape of the home that you're stuck in. So we've got a, this is what we're up against. <laughs> so we're currently at this antagonism. The current paradigm is the dweller versus the dwelling. Your experience of dwelling is not considered relevant by the architect who designed your building. And so how can we move from that paradigm to a new paradigm of conscious creation where the dweller amplifies the dwelling and the dwelling, the consciousness of the dweller and the consciousness of the dwelling create each other. That's what I'm proposing here. And this is what my work is about. So I practice phenomenology, straight up practice the ideas of Gaston Bachelard. And to demonstrate one of the ways to practice this, we're not gonna use the Vastu Purusha Mandala because you're not Hindus, you're not Brahmins. That's not our cosmos. I'd say that most of us believe in evolution and so I looked at different archetypes of evolution, and this is one that most of us could agree on. This would be uh, the tree of life. This is a really famous image of the tree of life drawn by Ernest Haeckel, a great, great um, illustrator, scientist, friends with Darwin. And he took Darwin's ideas, uh, origin of the species, and drew, took those thousand pages and crystallized this into this tree of life with three systems, the protists, the plants, and the animals, um, sort of the condensation of the system. And then we're up here with the vertebrates, upper right-hand corner. So I thought I would just sort of use this tree as sort of a, um, you can say a frame, a cosmic frame for how we're gonna look at the process of creating a conscious line. So the evolution of a conscious dwelling. So the first step, and we're gonna try it out today, is to listen. So we're using the central zone of the protists to listen. And so the first step is not to renovate your house or rebuild it, it's just to change your relationship to the space around you. And it starts by looking at your own consciousness. Who am I? What is my story? 
as you ask that question, you ask, where am I? Then you listen, what is the story of this place? And these questions lead to further questions. These are just a few that I've asked and continue to look into. What am I doing? And what does my footprint on this land and on this home look like? And then one of the largest questions, which you can actually listen for, is what does your land want? What does the home want? Right? So it's not an object. You're actually making it subjective. You're subjectifying your space. You're allowing it to have a subject space. That's what happens when you listen. You allow it to be the speaker and you to be the listener. And so what happens is you go through, in the process that I lead and in my practice, we go through all 10 levels of consciousness and listen to the house, <laughs> listen to the land and listen to ourselves. And it's a dialogue, it's a mirror, they reflect each other at all 10 levels of consciousness. And as you listen, you get a lot of data. That's your phenomenal data set. You collect all that data, you map all that data. And with that information, it completely transforms the baseline through which you can respond creatively. And as a designer, and most importantly, as an indweller, you don't need to be a designer to live in a conscious dwelling. In fact, in some ways it's, it's easier not to have to undo the modernist indoctrination. So that becomes transformation. How can we respond? How can we tell the story? How can we heal the land and ourselves? How can I participate? How can I contribute? How can I collaborate? That happens on all 10 levels of consciousness. And that the final step to a conscious dwelling is the activation. So all of these just sort of one rolls under the other. And then the, the, the dwelling and the dwellers start to engage. You expand together, you ground together, you reseed together. And then you start to wanna to share this place with others. And then ultimately we leave behind every home we ever come into. Either we sell it, we move or we die. So almost the final activation is, is your legacy of place, right? So case study, <laughs> this is all, you know, just basic framing ideas. We could have a whole session where I'm just having fun interviews with people that we've worked together on. So I think in the past year, I've been trying to count, I've worked on close to 50 homes. And because of the nature of the work, it's actually highly personal. Like we discover all sorts of things. It's like, I'm not quite a psychotherapist, but the information that I get just from looking at their home is so close to that person's um, mind and heart. And so it's difficult to share this work <laughs> in a public place and honor the, the client's privacy. But luckily we have Paige <laughs> and other collaborators where um, there's just so much that we can share and work together. And so this is one of the homes that I've been working on for the past year and a, a true delight and honor as each home is. It's like getting to know a friend. And Paige uh, is one of the earliest, um, you can say, innovators of this type of design, conscious design, conscious living, conscious dwelling. So her home, I started working on last year, 1271 Bosworth. And so it always starts with a conscious intake, sort of what is the current state of affairs? And so as I'm just going through, Paige, just like chime in whenever you feel moved. Whenever the spirit moves you, just be like, and I'd like to add that. So. You got it. Okay, great. So it started with the conscious intake. So I show up and I'm like, what do we got? And anyone who you know, wants to do this work, they've already done a ton of work. And so it starts with really honoring the amount of consciousness that's already gone into creating this sacred space. I, I don't think I've really ever stepped onto a home that doesn't already have that sacred quality to it in some way or another. So for sure, Paige's home, sacred home, sacred land, she had many altars already. So it, 
it wasn't that modern feeling at all, actually. It already had so much ornament, abundance, beautiful edge conditions within her home. She'd already gotten quite far down this, down this path. And so we started, Paige, you wanna to add to that or does that sound pretty accurate? Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And it, it might be useful to note that I'm an interior architect. So it was also decorated to my like liking. Yeah. Gorgeous, gorgeous house. And so the first thing we did was listen. And so greeting the spirits of the land and establishing a connection. And um, Paige, maybe you can speak to that process and how that was for you. It was really powerful because I had been doing this work with you as your apprentice and learning how to listen to the land um, on a different level than I had looked at it as an interior designer was quite a fascinating discovery for me. And I realized that I didn't really require any training. And I think that was what made it so much fun that it was accessible the moment I stepped into it. And um, I tend to be a little bit analytical. So for me, that was quite a joyful process that I could that I could do it that I could feel it along with you as we were discovering. So that was that was, that was a happy coincidence. And I wasn't sure how much you wanted to share about what we discovered. But uh, one of the things we discovered was a mass grave under your kitchen. So I didn't know if you wanted to share much more about that or? Yeah, that like. I, I mean, one of the things that was really compelling was to understand um, the energetic reference that I didn't know was there. And it was one of those moments where once we understood what it was, we couldn't unhear it. Right. And a little background, um, I was in a deep state of meditation uh, about a year, uh, prior to us buying the house. And um, I was given a vision that I should build my home and my family here. And I was shown this plot of land and I was shown the three Monterey cypresses that live, that are here on this land. And the spirit said, build your home and your family here. So that's the house that we have. So there was already a fair amount of magic that brought us to this site. And then um, about seven years later to the day almost when Jess and I started working together, we realized that one of the reasons I think that I had been called to this particular land was to do this healing that Jess and I were able to do. Um, it was a very powerful reconnection to the land and we discovered um, some things very personal to me and my family um, while we were healing the land. Um, and one of them was that uh, some Native Americans had been uh, killed on the land and that their spirits were still kind of held in the frame of the land and that they were ready to be released, but they needed to be honored and their story needed to be told. So they were kind of holding court um, until they could be acknowledged. Yeah, and it was it was amazing to just be in her kitchen and and discover this the story of the land. And I certainly didn't expect when I started doing this work that I would spend so much time. Just the extraordinary scale of the destruction of the indigenous peoples is continuously present when you do this work, and it's extremely profound to acknowledge that legacy of how our cities are built. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so through the listening, we started to transform. So one of the first transformations is, is after you develop a relationship is this back and forth. You can call it offering the land. When we did the healing for the native family that was on the land, um, we made offerings and we prepared all of these treats for them. And um, we shifted the whole energy through this ritual, through this the ritual becomes a living geometry, right? So it creates another type of relationship with your space that you never had before, just through listening. And there's a lot of release. And we discovered um, what we call the seed geometry. So ornament arises from like a seed geometry. So as you can say, the living ritual 
the living geometry of, of the healing happens, it creates a whole nother form for the consciousness of the home and your consciousness. Do you want to add to that page? That's pretty good. That's a, that's a pretty good step. Keep going. Okay. And then from transform, we go into activate. So one of the fun things is that you can also, once the home is clear, you can really, and you have a collaborative relationship with the land, you start to be able to program and install collaboratively, you can say power points, like a heart point, a soul point, a prosperity point. These are like zones that you charge through your intention. And then we also activated the water system, which was exciting and allowed the geometry to grow and developing what that might look like. And then finally, what was amazing to, one of the most amazing parts of this journey with this house, which was over a year long, was actually what we didn't anticipate was having to find the next family for it. And so that was almost like the true activation. There's something about the surrender, the letting go, and then allowing it to grow into the next story, the next chapter of the land. So it was, it was a true sort of full circle, full cycle with this house. Do you want to add, Paige? We called in the next people that were going to uh, be the caretakers of the land after I'd had some conversations with the spirits of the land. You're seeing images taken from the staging photos um, after we decided to sell the house. And um, my heart was still really tied to the land and um, I was feeling quite torn because I'm now living in Chicago and my my beautiful home is still in San Francisco. And uh, the moment I tapped back into the spirits of the land and the container that I had created there and let them know that we were moving on, but that we needed to find the next caretakers, we just kind of identified what were the attributes of the people that could care for this land. And as a final kind of moment, I wrote a letter to the next caretakers of the home and talked about the custom mural that I had created in the kitchen and the tile patterns echoing the trees in the backyard and told the story of how I had come to know about this house in a vision eight years earlier. And the moment that I was writing the letter to the prospective homeowners, the owner that now is going to um, caretake my house was writing a letter to me saying that she had been to the property for three times in three days and that the trees had been keeping her up at night and that she could feel the love woven into the walls and that she has been looking and praying for a place for her and her family to live for three years and when she walked into our home she realized that this was the next place for her and her family to live and so it was this simultaneous love story and what was the most important aspect was that it was, I had to kind of surrender when they were going to come and what they were going to look like. And I just had to kind of leave it over that the next caretakers would be found. And the moment I kind of surrendered that and stepped into the love and away from the fear that the house wasn't going to sell and all these other barometers, um, it sold within uh, 48 hours of being on the market and it was sold directly to this person who I knew would be the next caretaker. And that our letters were literally crossing each other in the ether simultaneously. It was kind of the, the cherry on top of the, uh, of the really beautiful cake. So now it has a new story and um, yeah, I, f I feel great about releasing it and knowing that it will be cared for along with the lands. I mean, it's just such an, a potent, um example of a conscious dwelling calling the next conscious dweller yeah. and i couldn't have it was almost like we knew that the house was conscious but then it like proved to us its consciousness yeah. <laughs> like well <laughs> so just summary of findings from this house and many homes that i've been working with over the past year. So genius loci is Latin for spirit of the land. So a summary of this journey is when we move into a home, 
we create altars and sacred moments. We try to place our story on the land, but it can't fully anchor until we listen to the story of the land and heal the land. Then the dweller becomes the conscious dweller and becomes part of the story of the place. We make the place when we allow the place to make us. So the place-making paradigm of co-creation between you and the place. It's not this imposition of some design or some idea. It's like the moment we go into that space of listening, we are made by the place. And it's been amazing to experience this with each home and each indweller that I work with. And so any questions before we do a little exercise? I have a little conscious dwelling exercise for us. No questions? Okay, if no questions, you can save your questions or you can type them into the chat. There'll be more time for questions after this. It's like a five minute meditation. So just um, take out a piece of paper or pen if you have one, or you can just do it in your mind. So this exercise is called Tempus Templum, which is Latin for sacred time. And so we're going to do a little map of our daily rituals and greet the spirit of our home. And through this process, you're gonna discover your sacred time and see how your sacred time fits into your sacred space. How do they merge? And so either you can do it through sketching or you can do it in meditation. I'll guide it the same either way. So let me know. Actually, I'll give you like 10 seconds to set up. So if you wanna do the meditation, put your feet flat on the floor, close your eyes, draw the spine tall. If you wanna do the sketch, just get a piece of paper or an iPad or your phone and you can go through the sketching. And so close your eyes or connect to your paper and just start by connecting to your breath. Follow your breath through your body, allowing it to ground into your feet. and ground into the earth. And as you ground into the earth, you're in your home right now. And just visualize the last 24 hours. as circles, as spheres of time. If you're sketching, you can draw circles. So each activity takes up a circle. This is your eating circle, your sleeping circle, your meditating circle, your Zoom circle, your bathroom circle, your Instagram circle. And you can see them each as their own discrete activity through time. Don't arrange them in space, just allow them to fill a shape of time. And you'll feel how your consciousness holds that. It's a memory, it's the shape, it's a structure of your consciousness. You can just let those containers around your actions slowly take form in your visualization space or on your paper. And let them just organically intersect, overlap, not touch each other, touch each other. And as you feel your page and your mind with time, you start to see how the time 
has a shape. And the shape of the time starts to create a space, not a three-dimensional objective space, but an energetic space, a mental space, a psychic space. So take a moment just to honor all of those spaces that you're creating all the time. How have you created a dedicated space for each of these in your home? Do they have a dedicated space? Some of them do, some of them don't. How can you start to create or allow them to organize in an intentional way? for your living geometry. You can put your ideas down in paper. Or you can continue to visualize them in your meditation as you start to see how the space and time maps into your built environment, into your built space. And you can even zoom in on the edge condition on how those spaces touch each other. How do those different activities touch each other? Are there hard boundaries? Are there soft boundaries? Are there porous boundaries? Are there completely no boundaries? And so this is the beginning of rebuilding the edges of your consciousness. Starting to look, listen, to how you hold your own consciousness every day. And how does your space hold them? You might be getting ideas for how you might wanna rearrange your space. You can just let them come. If they don't come, don't think them. And so that's a short seven minute exercise as a brief taste of what this work starts to do. And so just a summary of this process, the general hypothesis, the general frame is that through this process of listening, transforming and activating, you, the dweller, and your dwelling simultaneously become conscious. It's not like you have one without the other. And the way we do this is through rebuilding the edge condition, how all of these moments of your life touch. Okay? This starts to rehabilitate the structures of our consciousness, which have been dismantled by the types of shapes that we've been forced to inhabit. <laughs> and it creates the conditions for cosmos, for ornament, for magic, for sacred space. And as you develop the skill set, you develop an inclusive phenomenal data set. You increase your intuition, your ability to sense and listen to things that you previously couldn't hear or feel. And this sets you on a path, this sets you on a trajectory. From conceptual to conscious, thanks Yosh, <laughs> from 
Cartesian to the living geometry of ritual. And perhaps one of my favorites is from iteration to efflorescence. So the big word in modern design is iteration, copy paste. But we're actually talking about a different type of action, which is efflorescence. It is the organic growth that mirrors nature, which is how ornament grows. So this word efflorescence is a foil to iteration, which is mechanical. This is one of the trajectories of this work. So you can see on the left, this is Louis Sullivan's drawing of how things efflorescence. And for those of you who don't know, Louis Sullivan is the architect who coined the famous phrase, form follows function. And here you can see the origin of that thought because he's actually pre-modern. He had a lot of ornament on his buildings. And so he talks about the power of the seed because ornament, the story of a place originates from a seed and then it grows, the sacred geometry. So the seed is the real thing, the seat of identity. Within its delicate mechanism lies the will to power. The function of the seed, in other words, the trajectory of that seed is to seek and eventually find its full expression and form. See that? Form follows function. That's what a seed does. And so the seat of power and the will to live constitute the simple working idea upon all which that follows is based as to efflorescence. And so we use this, um, you can say, foundation that Louis Sullivan set, one of the great American architects, pre-modern, did a lot of buildings in the 1920s. And a few more, seven, so we have time for, for some questions and comments, but just one question that I often get, and I'll, I've just prepared the slide for it. Uh, how does conscious dwelling relate to sustainability? And this is one that's another very topical one. So I'll just sort of give you the overall uh, response to this one, which is the first thing a conscious dwelling does is you stop, because you stop relating to the house as an objective material space, you stop seeing it as something that you consume. You're not a consumer anymore. The other way that conscious dwelling affects uh, sustainability and the conversation around sustainability is that ornament is the union of the built environment and the natural environment. And so you have a picture here of radiolaria, which are these drawings of um, biological phenomena, and then architectural ornament. And so they mirror each other. Ornament is the embedding of this consciousness into the building. So it, that's almost like the building becomes a part of nature. Another way that it relates to a conversation and sustainability is the connection between defoliation of buildings and deforestation of forests. And so not coincidentally, the rapid scale of deforestation and the removal of leaves from architecture are um, parallel because the consciousness that enables us to destroy rainforests also doesn't want to have leaves in buildings. So if you look at ancient architecture, the foundation of ornament is leaves. And so part of our built environment reflects what we're doing to the natural environment. And so part of, for me, a big part of sustainability, and this is the conversation at Yale Forestry School and Yale Architecture School, one of the conversations was how the relationship between the built environment through not just green walls, but bringing actual uh, biological systems to the ornament design and how we actually construct the building itself will create the consciousness that will enable humanity to be in right relationship to the planet. And so it all starts at home and we create the consciousness that can regenerate and restore the environment. So any questions? Thank you, Jessica. Hi, Tim. Hi. That was that was great. Really uh, fascinating. I am a question. So this idea of conscious dweller uh, creating a conscious 
you know, space, how, how does that bridge to what's going on? I think you alluded to some of that in some of your slides, but how, like I'm sure, you know, most people on this Zoom call, it's like, okay, so how does this, I think you've, you've laid out some nice, like, like that exercise that we did, I think was so um, tactile, so, so concrete in terms of describing my activities and then that becomes the shape. I, I love that. So I guess just elaborate on that in terms of how do we, especially during this time, I think everybody's just feeling um, at this moment, all the stuff that's going on, you know, in our world. And like you said, we're, we're stuck in our homes, you know, uh, oh, just more elaboration, I think would be great. Yeah, I, I would love to elaborate more, but I know people have to go. So I'm going to go to the final slide so people can see my contact and then I'm going to answer your question. Right. Okay. Perfect. Wow. Okay. All these questions coming in. Okay. So let me just say this quickly your conscious home is the seed for your conscious world. And so we'll talk about how it grows in just a minute. But in the meantime, if you need to go, this is, thank you guys so much for listening and I'll take your questions now, but if you want more information, there's two websites you can go to, makeconscious.com and makeconsciousdesign.com. And I'm organizing a panel actually Wednesday on architecture and social change with Yale Women in Architecture. So if you wanna hear three amazing projects by three amazing women, uh, it's just free. You can go to that, it's on my website. If you wanna have a, conscious intake, you can just email me and I'd love to discuss your project with you, learn more about it. And if this work, if you're like, if that meditation was just not enough for you and you wanna go through a 30 day meditation journey of becoming a conscious dweller and a conscious dwelling, next week I'm starting a, a course called Your Phenomenal Home and we're actually gonna be doing it with the battery as a case study, which is super exciting. And so you get to discover the conscious dweller and the conscious dwelling through 30 days of virtual daily meditations on Zoom and office hours at the battery. And so that information is also on my website if you want to sign up and it'll be in the follow-up email to this event as well. So for those of you who have to go, here's the info. And then I've got all these questions to answer. So I will continue. So Tim, how does this, your question is how does this work scale? Is that right? Yeah. So yep. just the way I'm thinking about, like just the way Paige's home, it wasn't really, when she, it's not like there was anything wrong with it when I, when I met her. It was just like we have the opportunity to create so much more consciousness, so much more learning. So this work presented opportunity for those of us that want to up level, right? So everything's, quote unquote, fine or not. And so it's a choice as to how much you're actually not fine with the status quo. I think that's a starting point. And then this presents a tool for you to completely radically transform how you relate to that. And so Paige's house is a perfect example. It was already an amazing house, but it was like, she had these beautiful altars, beautiful design, but it wasn't fully anchored in her consciousness or in the home. And so this work gave us an opportunity to just make it that much more powerful. And so the minute, so most of you on this call are, I'm getting the sense that you're successful, entrepreneurial, creative, you're already doing very well. So like, what does this work have to offer you? Well, the minute, you start to really look at your consciousness in your home, you create a whole new way of expanding. It's like, you don't even have to push because you're working at the causal level. And so when you work at the seed level of your home and your consciousness and align it to be the most um, conscious, the efflorescence, you set up those conditions for efflorescence. You set up the conditions for the thing just to grow like nature. And uh, it will automatically, without your trying, scale to all parts of your life. So through looking at your home, it will just scale to your land. 
your neighborhood, your city. It'll scale to how you design your companies, your business relationships, your org structure. And so that's what's happened with this work itself. And so I started doing this work. Um, so Tim, I guess the best way to answer your question is just to tell you how it effloresced in my life. Because <laughs> it started just with, I was doing a master plan for a retreat center in Calistoga and it was destroyed by the fires. And I was like, oh my God, this 300 acres of devastated land. Like I need to really learn a little bit about healing this land because my current skill set doesn't have it. And so that's when I actually got in touch with a Taoist master and Taoist teachings on land healing and feng shui. And that completely opened uh, how I look at land and the home. And then that relationship changed how I look at everything. And so Make Conscious was born. And from Conscious Home, this now scales. This is the ecosystem of the collective that I'm a part of. So conscious land is how does this go into landscape architecture? Conscious design is how it goes into branding. Conscious EDU is how it goes into education and conscious labs is, is how we give it back to communities that can't afford this type of work. And so it's just a whole network of conversation because it just touches every aspect of your life. You wanna respond you. to that Tim? Or should I answer to Tanya? Uh, oh, beautiful. Thank you. Wow. Tanya, she was just talking about fire. Okay. How would you approach dwellings destroyed by fire and the idea of rebuilding? How would you approach any buildings that remain standing and a rehabilitation of them? Okay. That's a great, that's exactly how I got started with this work is because of healing fire. And so there's this phenomena with trauma, whether it's human trauma or land trauma. If you have a trauma spot, you attract the same kind of trauma. And so my feng shui teacher calls this, um, he calls it the vehicle black spot. But for example, if there's a place on the road that had a car accident, it's almost like there's um, a negative energy anchor there and it, it magnetizes the same phenomena to it. And so lands that are constantly being burned by fires actually have fire prone spots that trauma is anchored in the land. So California is one giant fire prone spot right now. And so we actually have a lot of healing to do. And this is what got me into this work. And so you, you listen, you find where that spot is and you begin a healing process that keeps attracting fire to that land. And the idea of rebuilding is, uh, so with the land that I've, the several pieces of land that I've worked on that have gone through fire trauma over thousands of years. It's not recent. And you can talk to the spirit of the land and get information about that. And often rebuilding, it's not just, you don't just rebuild the same structure. For example, with, um, with one particular piece of land that I worked on, uh, it actually, the whole land was rotating counterclockwise. The whole water system was in this negative spiral vortex. So we actually had to reposition certain critical uh, ritual anchor rocks. So indigenous peoples have been on there for hundreds of years and we, we actually found their ancient structures and we actually had to change the entire um, direction of the circulation of energy in, the, in that area. And so the rebuilding doesn't start with physical structures. It starts just by shifting the energy of the land. So it stops attracting fire, stops attracting trauma. And then you begin the master planning process. After, because here's what's so revolutionary about this process. I never learned this in site analysis that you can actually change the site. So after you heal the land, the, the site actually has a phenomenal shift and it wants something different after it's been healed. So you don't really want to rebuild or even come up with a plan for rebuilding until you've gone through the process of healing the land. Otherwise it will attract the same fire. It will attract the same trauma. Uh, how would you approach any buildings that remain standing and the rehabilitation of them? Uh, same thing, same process. You mean in a, so Tanya, do you mean in a fire prone spot or in general?
I'll just. So in general, or I guess the ones that didn't get burnt um, in Napa specifically. Okay. Yeah. So there's pathways of fire that have gone through. And so we would actually want to map the whole neighborhood and see how many different pathways the fire has taken and listen to the homes that stood and what protections were in place that allowed them to stand. So oftentimes uh, there's actually energetic protections around different structures that allow them to, to stay. So the process of rehabilitating uh, Napa would start with a site analysis of looking for, you can say fire prone spots over time, and then basically doing a land healing, land clearing. And then from that, listening to the spirits of the land and coming up with a strategy for rebuilding that honors what they want. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Any more questions? I'm happy to stay on, answer more questions. And you can email me. I'm happy to uh, answer. Have I'm happy to have conscious intakes with you all at the battery or on Zoom. And would love it if you wanted to join the course starting next week. Any more questions? Sherry, Millie, Adele, Mike. I just want to thank you again. That was great. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, yeah. Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth, you made it. <laughs> Hi, Adele. And thank you, Paige. Thank you, Paige. I loved your sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That's so sweet. Yeah, it was uh, very sweet. Yeah. Cool. It's quite a hefty story. If anybody wants to hear the non cliff note versions, it's got a lot of uh, drama, drama, so involved. much drama. Yeah, it's quite a powerful story. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, amazing. Yeah. Um, so the people that are still on Tanya, Adele, Sherry, Millie. Otherwise, Paige and Tim and I can just talk about whatever we, oh, Paige, you gotta go? Thank you. That was so Thank you, great. Paige. Let's see, hi, someone day. just turned their video on. Hi, Jessica, it's Millie. Um, I just wanna say thank you, this is beautiful. And I just moved into a new space and it's not yet furnished. So doing this meditation was really special. And I'm really excited to join your class in the next week. Oh, wow. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thanks. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Yeah, the, the class will be perfect for settling into your new home. Mm -hmm. All right. Adele, do you want to do you have any questions? I'd love to hear more about what's interesting for you. <laughs> or Brett's. This is Zoom life. I'm like, who are these interesting people that find this interesting? I'll stop the recording. So, yeah.